This is the Chicago Golf Report podcast, hosted by Walter Liss. Today's guest is Chris Charnas, commercial real estate professional at Lynx Capital Advisors. So, I guess my history is I was a I have a graduate degree from the University of Wisconsin in real estate um, back in 1990 and got out and got a job as an industrial real estate broker selling warehouses and manufacturing. Did that for like five years and decided I didn't want to do that forever and actually got a job working for Crown Golf Properties, um, which was a little company back in that day that was, you know, getting management contracts and buying, trying to buy courses. And did that for a couple, three years, decided I missed brokerage. So I went back to my old company, which was Cushman and Wakefield, and started their national golf group. And so I was at Cushman from like 98 to 2008. And 2008, I left Cushman to start my own company, Lynx Capital Advisors. So I sell golf courses almost exclusively all over the country. Um, you know, I've done little deals on other stuff, but it's, you know, I've done $350,000 deals in Tennessee, and I've sold... You know, a, I sold Kemper Lakes for eighteen and a half million dollars a few years, a number of years ago, um, mm-hmm. but kind of all over the place and kind of seen the market go up and down. But definitely, you know, 2020, the beginning of February, March, all of a sudden, everyone's like, "Uh oh, this is it. This is going to be the death knell for golf. No one's going to be able to do anything. The industry isn't going to make it. And then the one thing that you could do was you could play golf. And so all of a sudden. 2020 everyone's rounds went up everyone's revenue went up you know memberships sold out and i was like all right this is awesome but it was like okay is this just a blip or is this actually going to keep going and so 2021 still good 2022 still solid 23 you talk to the guys at kemper and troon concert they're like we're full you know our t-shirts are full our memberships are full we are, you know, we don't see anything, any going back at this point. Um, and you're even hearing some stories of, you know, developers talking about building new courses here and there. Um, so, it, you know, is a potential increase in supply. I mean, certainly, you know, if you base it on, can you get new equipment or can you get new carts? You can't find them, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just fast. I mean, there's, there's no carts for any of these guys to find. There's no equipment for any of them to buy, right? You can't. So everyone's scrambling. It's amazing um, how that's the economy hasn't readjusted and golf courses can't get what they want. So what do you think the factors are for the continued spike of the popularity of, of golf? Well, I think, you know, we got people back on the course, right? I think that the, You know, Top Golf, I think, played a part in it. Sort of the off the course facilities got people interested in the game. Then it was fun, and now you have places like Five Iron Golf in Chicago, and there's lots of simulators out there. And I think that's sort of there are a lot of millennials out there. Hey, this is fun, but they never went to the course. Then all of a sudden, in 2020, they couldn't be inside, so they went to the course and went, "Oh yeah, this is fun. Um, This is a blast. I like being out here." So you know, golf's actually managed to make to be able to keep them. People have joined, I mean, the key indicator is private clubs, I think, in a lot of ways. Because once you join a private club, you know, and your your family becomes part of the club and your wife makes friends at the club, it's really hard to quit, right? So I think people <laughs> join and they stay, and that's a huge bonus for the industry. And then on the day, and then it filters down to daily fee from there. Because after that, then you know, you can't get in a private club because there's waiting lists, and then so then you keep playing more daily fee golf. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about uh, golf simulator businesses, uh, indoor golf simulator business standalone. Is that something that um, you've been involved with? It, it, I mean, it, could you see yourself uh, helping those folks if they need to sell their business in the future? Or is that kind of it's it's kind of in its infancy right now? Yeah, I haven't seen many of those trade. Um, but so I haven't done any of those deals. I've sold a couple of ranges along the way. Um, I sold, um, the white pines dome a number of years ago. Um, Mike Monroe had that and I sold it to Kemper sports. The, so, I mean, if somebody asked me if I could sell a top golf facility, I certainly could. Um, I think there's demand for it. I mean, those do really well. I mean, the, the amount of 
peak traffic they get through those is unbelievable. I mean, especially when you compare it to, you know, like a standalone golf course that might get 20, 25,000 rounds, you know, a top golf facility. I mean, they could get double, triple, quadruple that, I think, in some years. I mean, you know, they're open 12, you know, 12 months out of year. There's no seasonality to it, right? No time constraints. They, they do better at night even. It, the seasonality is a big component, right? Because you have green grass facilities where the winter, usually that's when they kind of sit away from it. Now right. you have golf simulator businesses where the winter is when they thrive. They need people in the summertime. How do you kind of kind of reconcile all that? It's still fun. I mean, I think it's, you know, you don't have to play. I mean, one of the big trends in the industry everywhere is, you know, not as many people want to play 18 whole rounds. So that there's definitely more interest in playing shorter. And I think, you know, you can go to a simulator and play for an hour or two versus committing to four hours or more at a golf course. So I think they still will get that. I mean, what's going to be interesting to see is like everything else is there going to be an oversaturation in the simulator market because it, it feels like every golf course, every private club is adding simulators. And at a certain point, you know, are there too many? I mean, I don't know. It seems like everything else at some point you get too many. Mm -hmm. So from a, uh, a uh, sale of a golf course business, what are the things that you're looking for? What what makes the that course marketable versus courses that aren't really marketable? Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's an economic thing, right? It's how much, you know, what's the gross revenue and how much money is it making? What's falling to the bottom line? Um, locations, key after that, right? I mean, it's still got to be in a decent spot, but if you have, really good numbers it kind of overcomes what could be a potentially bad location because people are going there um you know the key things that drive down value are going to be deferred capital improvements whether that's car pass bunkers um maintenance equipment you know bad roofs that kind of stuff always you know can drop down to price and before 2020 to be honest you know, you look at a golf course and they all had deferred CapEx because they weren't, they were barely surviving, right? Every, no one, no, everyone was just being able to pay their mortgage. They weren't being able to do anything additional to the course. All of a sudden, 2020 happens and everyone's flush with cash. So carpets have been fixed, bunkers have been fixed. Now they haven't gotten equipment, mind you, because they can't find it from Toro, but they are, you know, everything else seems like, you know, it's been improved. Mm -hmm. So is that a big part of your role when you look at a business that they want to sell and you're going to look at the books, but then you also have to look at it in terms of what's the potential? Because it could be maybe that the ownership group has kind of lost interest or maybe they haven't invested it. You kind of have to look for these nuggets and to be able to say, you know what, I think if we had the right team in there and the right resources, it could do this. Right. That's the part of the, you know, that is part of the story. It's like, okay, you know, unless you're looking for a straight, 10% return, you're going to buy for X and you're fine with it. You know, everybody wants, you know, if you buy a $3 million asset, you'd like to be able to sell it for five or six in five years, 10 years, whatever that is. And so in order to do that, you have to do something different, right? So then, you know, part of my job is to say, hey, you know, this ownership group brought it this far, they've done this, but, you know, there's money on the table here, whether that's food and beverage or increased membership or increased seasonal membership or increasing the dues, right? There's, you're always looking for an angle to, how can you add additional value to it? And, you know, probably in every course in the country, there's there's money on the table that someone's not doing because people don't like the F&B. You know, in particular, that's a big one because mm -hmm. no one likes doing that. So you mentioned Kemper Sports, you mentioned Troon. Like, who are the primary places or, or buyers of golf courses that you look for? Is it usually those groups? Can you hold on there? one second? My dog has invaded <laughs> my room. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I had to lock him out. Okay. Yeah, no worries. So when you mentioned Kemper Sports and Troon, when you're looking for buyers, mm -hmm. is is most of the sale going to the bigger groups like that? Or is it like 50-50 where it goes to other private groups? What do you see? It's definitely not fit. I mean, I mean, they're only I mean, there's Kemper, there's Concert, there's Heritage, there's Arsis, there's Club Corp, there's Escalante, you know, there's Arnold Palmer. Those are kind of the big institutional buyers. And maybe I'm getting one, but they can only buy so much. And they're looking to buy stuff that has, you know, gross revenues, $4 million and above. And they're not, 
you know, they want to be in major markets. They, they, it's a pretty tight bullseye that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, if you look at, I mean, Heritage obviously bought a ton last year um, and Kemper's got some money and they're trying to buy more. Uh, and concerts stepped up. But I mean, even when, you know, you say they bought a ton, it's not nowhere near as much as 50% of the market. You know, significant number of courses are, you know, have gross revenues below 4 million, right? Mm -hmm. And those are, you know, regional guys, guys that own one or two golf courses already and want a third. They're high net worth or even medium net worth guys that, you know, love golf and want to own one. Um, it's real estate developers. It's, you know, superintendents or golf pros with rich uncles um, that, you know, have always wanted to have their own place. Uh, you know, and a lot of, a lot of deals, especially on the smaller size, it's not necessarily the national player. It's the, it's a regional guy. It's somebody local. It's somebody that already has a connection to it. Um, you know, and I get calls, you know, pretty, pretty rarely from owners. I'm like, listen, you know, I can't help you because it's probably too small of a deal. And you probably already know the buyer, right? He's somebody local. You just got to find him. Mm -hmm. So then that's the big question for me is then how do you stimulate dem that demand? How do you go out and harvest these folks who would be good potential buyers? You know, I have, you know, online resources, right? Whether it's LoopNet or Crexy, um, you get tons of responses from both those when you put things online. Um, I've got a database of about 15,000 email addresses that I send to. I use LinkedIn, right? I mean, sort of all those connections. And in a lot of cases, it's people finding out about the course, right, locally. Someone hears about it, chatter, and then they say, oh, yeah, that guy, uh, that guy in Chicago, Scott, you should talk to him. And I get calls like that. So it's, a lot of it is making sure you get word out because then, I mean, because everyone talks. Golfers love talking. Golf pros love talking more than anybody else. So word gets out and then I get calls from that way. And then my job is to kind of harness them, bring them in, you know, get them the information and then start pushing them toward making offers. Uh, you know, and it's not like, even you know, the six or seven big names that we talked about, they're sitting on capital and they need to place it. But there aren't that many. It's not like you're selling a multifamily apartment building where there's, you know, 100 buyers out there and they're all sitting on $250 million and they're feeling pressure. You know, some rich guy, you know, who's got 10 million in the bank or whatever, he's not feeling pressure to buy a golf course. He falls in love with it and wants to buy it. So it's a different sale. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you have on your website, you, golf course development, redevelopment, how much redevelopment work do you get involved with as well? Well, I mean, that's, it's interesting. It's less now up until 2020, every deal you looked at, if I got 10 calls, eight were from developers. Right. And most of the time, I mean, a lot of the low, most of the low hanging fruit on the development sites are even picked. Right. I mean, if it could have been developed into housing, it probably would have been. Um, and a lot of the stuff, especially stuff that was built in the you know 80s and 90s, is already part of a residential community. It can't be developed. It's zoned open space or it's in the middle of you know a swamp. It's in wetlands or whatever. It's just not going to it's not going to happen. So you have to keep it. You know, it's going to stay off so that, you know, I get a lot of those calls, but they're just not reality. It's not possible. How do you see yourself then as far as it fits within the golf business? Because you can make a pretty good argument that you're kind of the straw that stirs a lot of the things that happen. I mean, this is significant deals that are, are taking place that you're shepherding. Uh, I mean, do you see yourself as being sort of the kind of a the, the engine that drives like a back end part of it? I don't know if I give myself that much credit. Um, you know, you're the middleman trying to help facilitate things, right? There's buyer sellers out there that just want to be move on to their next stage in life. And they need someone to help them. They need someone to shepherd the process. They need someone, you know, to handle the calls from people that don't know anything about the business or, you know, the number of calls I get from people that don't have the money or are trying to scam. It's just amazing. Mm. You know, and after 25 years, whatever it is in the business, I'm pretty good at, you know, rooting out the scammers. Sometimes I still get caught, but I mean, you get, I mean, I got a couple of emails in the past month from, someone on a oil rig in Hong Kong who wanted to buy, I'm like, really? And it was like the same guy trying on two or three different times. And I'm like, I think I got an email from your uncle. And he didn't <laughs> respond, but it's like, you just got to flush those out. And it's like, occasionally I forget about them. So 
I don't know if I'm the straw that serves the drink, but I definitely help move things along. <laughs> so right now on your website, you've got, I think, seven facilities for sale, including yeah. the links at Carillon, which is an interesting property because you got 27 holes. Right. It, it's pretty, it's in a nice location right off the tollway. Um, what are the things that, uh, like for a facility like that, what, what helps you move it quicker versus something that might stagnate? Uh, that is a unique asset. One, it's got 27 holes, you're right. Um, it's got a nice little clubhouse. The clubhouse is owned, operated by one of the partners, and there's definitely upside potential in there. It's got a tent that's underutilized, so the f and is definitely a place. It, where it's most unique is the fact that it has a snow plowing business um, that's extensive. Um, this year, there's been no snow, so it's not as profitable, but I mean, they might have a couple million, they have more equipment, snow plowing and everything else than any other course I've ever seen. Um, so it's an interesting, you know, during the off season when it's snowing, you know, they do all the neighborhoods in the area, right? I mean, even to the point of it's an over 55 community, they'll do the driveways, they'll do the sidewalks. So they're, you know, it's a really good business. So that one, you know, it takes a little bit of a unique buyer because most golf guys just want golf, but this one's like, okay, you can, you, you get rid of the seasonality, right? Cause you have something else to do. So I think that one's it's, and, and there's tons of F, F and B potential with it. And if operated right. And the guy that's operating, it is really good on staff, the GM, the 27 holes takes a little bit, I'd say more talent to manage that T sheet, but if done right, you can really maximize revenue. So it's an interesting aspect of your expertise is you able to see these various things like a snow plowing business to avoid seasonality. Um, do you share some of these, these ex, you know, the experiences with other facilities and give them advice? Yeah, no one listens to me, but sure. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think but the, one, the one thing I always tell everybody, and I don't think anyone ever takes it into consideration is like, you know, if their food and beverage business isn't doing great, I'd like, I'd add a pizza oven, right? I'd add a pizza oven and I'd deliver pizzas out of the back of a golf cart to people's houses because pizza's cheap. It's really cheap to make. It's got a huge profit margin. Everyone loves it. If you can do a decent job at it, you know, pizza ovens aren't that expensive. You know, that's a 12 month business. You don't, you know, people might come, you might get more people to come into your restaurant, but you can deliver it. And, you know, so that's always my advice that no one listens to. <laughs> Somebody someday will. We'll finish up with a, a couple rapid fire questions. You're involved a little bit with Canal Shores. Can you talk about a lot? Um, what's your what do you feel? There's so many things. So many people are passionate about Canal Shores. Temper Sports is now involved. W what do you think about when you you talk about that facility? Uh, that's my extra job. That so I'm in charge of golf and construction, and I'm deeply involved in the fundraising. Um, we're meeting with people from Evanston and we'll met this week as far as zoning, as far as permitting. Um, when we're done, we, when I'm looking forward to the hall of fame, we're going to have there of the kids that started as caddies at canal shores and got Evans scholarships and have their picture on the wall in our clubhouse and a kid after kid after kid are going to say, Oh yeah, I got my start there at this little place that, you know, isn't anything to anybody, but all of a sudden it's, it's, we're going to be something really cool. And it's amazing what, you know, Josh Lesnick's been able to do with um, bringing in the first tee and the Western golf association. And, you know, there's a big group of us that are pushing this forward. And for the, for the first time, we really feel like we've got momentum and it's just, it's pretty exciting. Why do you think that place is so special? Because I can just list off, Leah Jesse, who I just interviewed from the first tee, Steve Skinner from Kemper Sports, Chef Andy Murray, uh, Vince Pellegrino from the Western Golf Association. All these people I just talked to all mentioned Canal Shores. It's like there's some kind of, I don't know, there's a vibe there that you don't see anywhere else. What makes it so special? You know, it's the clubhouse that we share with the American Legion. It's the, you know, it's the L that crosses through the property. It's just the build, you know, you're walking and you're going across these streets and you're walking across the canal. It's the kind of the community that we put together there. It's the lumberjacks that are out there every Saturday and Sunday cutting down trees and then burning them down. It's like, you don't see it anywhere else, right? 
you know, it's the dog walkers that are out there, hopefully avoiding the golf balls. It's, you know, it's the football parking that's, you know, in many years kept us alive. It's just, you know, we're such a part of the fabric of the community. Then you, then you lay, and we've always had a really vibrant youth golf program, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden you add in first tee and then you bring the powerhouse that is the WJ into it. And it's like, it takes us to a different level. And we're, we're part of an interesting national discussion that I don't think any of us thought we'd ever be in. That's such a great story. So let's finish up with, uh, you, you mentioned the uniqueness of, of uh, Lynx and Caroline having a snow plowing business. What's your favorite sale? Like what was the sale perhaps that you thought, oh boy, this could be a challenge. I don't know how we're going to pull this off. And then you pulled it off and it kind of resonated, provided you a lot of fulfillment. What What is that? What do you think of? You know, I love the fact I sold Kemper Lakes, right? That was a big deal. You know, that that was a great one to get done. Um, you know, I sold Troy Byrne in Minneapolis last year, um, which went pretty quickly, but it was, you know, it was a great ownership group and they were motivated to sell it and we got a really good price for it. Um, I did a below market deal a couple of years ago uh, where Concert had a course. I had a client that was looking for something and I never represent buyers, right? That's just not something I do. But I had a, you know, a buyer that came to me and said, hey, I want to buy something. And I called Peter Nanula and he's like, yeah, well, I've got one that's a daily fee that I'd sell, but no one can know about it. And I need a 10 times. And, you know, they can't visit the property till the contract's signed. And we, you know, it ended up selling for 16 million bucks, um, right? At the kind of the beginning, you know, in the middle of COVID. I think that those are probably the favorite ones, the big ones. I mean, I sold it, you know, there is a different satisfaction in selling a $325,000 deal at Bainberry, Tennessee that I'd never seen, <laughs> you know, and that came with like 200 acres of land with it, but it's, it's still on the list of deals I completed. <laughs>